Hey there and welcome to episode number 23 of I'm Just Gonna Say It. I'm your friendly internet renegade Aaron and today I want to talk about the difference between evidence and proof. Is there a difference you ask? Yes, there definitely is a difference and I've been seeing more and more how for instance science reporters in the, in the news media are screwing it up completely. So, um, I made a little animation to explain the difference. We're gonna have a look at that and I'll discuss it later. Um, here we go with number 23. I was reading uh, the local paper uh, recently about this uh, psychology study which was reported on by, uh, by a journalist and he ended it with so now it is proven that blah 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 and that kind of bothered me because that's not in psychology there's no such thing as proof there's only evidence so um, it's important that people know the difference so um, I made a little animation as I told you before um, to explain it so here we go seeing the difference between proof versus evidence as we go along this presentation you will realize why you needed to know this first we have to explain another difference the difference between theoretical science and empirical science Theoretical sciences are based solely on theory and formal logic. Math is the perfect example of this. Empirical science is also based on theories, but it validates these theories based on observation and manipulation during experimental setups. Psychology would be a good example here. Theoretical science deals with proof. Like proof for the ABC formula, for instance. Proof is certain. Think of the word foolproof. Empirical science, on the other hand, deals in evidence. Evidence is a piece of information making a certain hypothesis more likely, or more evident, to be correct. Proof is per definition 100% certain. Evidence, on the other hand, is by definition never certain. An example of proof would be 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 because 2 minus 1 is equal to 1. Now this explanation isn't complete, but it will suffice for the explanation here. So this would be an example of proof. An example of evidence is as follows and will be a bit more complicated. Say the mayor of Limboville wants to know if the majority of his town's inhabitants is happy. Limboville has 40,000 inhabitants. They are going to do a survey amongst 1,000 of its people asking if they are happy. Let's say 56% said yes and 44% said no. What the scientists then do is calculate the odds that such a result came about by chance. This chance is known as the p-value power of 0.05, which means the odds that the results came about by chance are less than 5%, is considered significant in statistical science. Had the results been 51% yes and 49% no, for instance, absolutely speaking, of course, there would still be a majority. However, the chance that that 1% came about by chance is bigger than 0.05, so this would statistically speaking not be considered a majority also means that in a study with only 100 participants, a 1% difference would be less significant than the same 1% difference in a study with 1000 participants. After all, absolutely speaking, 1% 1 of 100 equals 1 person and 1% 1 of 1000 equals 10 persons. This is also the main reason why P is limited as a source of information about an effect, because with a large enough sample size, any difference becomes significant. Effect size to the rescue. Effect size quantifies differences between two groups. It emphasizes the size of the difference rather than confounding it with sample size. So if you have a p-value and an effect size, you can more reliably estimate the magnitude of an effect or difference. So that was the video about the difference between evidence and proof. Um, we're going to discuss it now, right after this. So maybe you can imagine now why I was kind of annoyed by the journalist uh, reporting on a psychology study saying that uh, there was now proof that this and this was true. That bothered me uh, deeply, so I hope everybody knows the difference now, um, because uh, especially when you're a science reporter you should know these things, because you're confusing people and telling them the wrong thing basically. 
plus you're kind of disrespecting the, the scientists who did the research in the first place by misrepresenting his, his research. Um, another example of a thing that uh, these reporters often screw up is for instance mixing uh, correlation with causation. There was this famous study where they found that the more you drink during winter holiday, the uh, less the chance you would break a leg uh, while you were skiing. That of course sounds not completely logical and that's because it's a correlation and not a causation. Because what is obviously the case is that the more you drink the less time you spend on the slopes in the first place, so the less chances you have of breaking your leg. I want to leave it at that for now. Um, comment if you have a suggestion for a video or if you want anything uh, to know about this subject. Like, share and subscribe of course and until next time, bye bye. Before I forget, uh, in the description down here are a few links to interesting studies about the subject, so don't forget to look at that. So now you might understand why I was bothered by the by the journalist. Uh,